This video is brought to you by Rocketman Rewards. Keep watching or check the link in the video description to find out more. I've made a ton of different videos saying certain cities have built the wrong transit system. It's a bit of an RM Transit cliche at this point. Now, quite reasonably, if you live in one of these cities or care about it, like I frankly do for all of them, you're probably wondering, great, so we built the wrong transit system, what are we supposed to do now? Now, today's video is not about a city that did something wrong, but rather how it's not all lost if your city builds the wrong type of transit system and how some of the greatest transit cities in the world created their transit network by taking certain transit lines and transit modes and transitioning them to entirely different ones to provide more and better service. If you're not already, follow me on Twitter as well as Instagram to stay in the loop with upcoming videos, city and transit related news, and some hot takes here and there. Now, if you're new here, I've done a lot of videos talking about how various cities may have not designed their transit systems in the optimal way or may have not chosen the optimal mode to serve the type of routes they're building. For example, Los Angeles is building super long regional scale rail lines with high floor trams. And Ottawa built a metro style system with low floor trams. And there are a lot of other places that are in similar situations. A lot of American cities like Dallas and Denver have built regional rail style systems, but using light rail trains, giving up the potential higher speed and greater comfort that would come with proper regional rail. At the same time, a city like Seattle, one of the most successful cities in the United States for ridership growth in recent years, as well as just economic growth, has built a metro system using light rail technology and with some grade crossings. And that system will likely not be able to meet the future capacity demands of a city the scale of Seattle. Now, I think the problem here to a fair degree is that the answer to every transit problem in North America, at least for a long time, has been light rail. Even if it wasn't necessarily the most appropriate mode, to be fair, it's the mode we've been constructing a lot of. And so even if a system wasn't necessarily best adapted to it, the benefits of having a technology that we'd already built in other places and that we knew how to construct and operate was seen as greater than choosing the mode that was perhaps most ideally suited to a certain city. Now seeing this, you arrive at questions like, is this a lost cause? Or can you realistically transform a transit system from one transit mode to another over time? If you watched my recent video on Belgium's coast tram, you probably heard the bit about interurban, essentially long distance tram lines. You see, in North America, most of the interurbans died, and in Europe, some of them did survive, but mostly as a modern adaptation of their traditional form, as with the coast tram. But in Japan, a lot of interurbans evolved from interurbans, long distance tram systems, into entirely different forms of transit. And I think these systems can paint a really good picture of what systems in North America and beyond could do to transition from light rail to modes of transit better suited to the roles they're actually playing. Now, I'm going to get into what happened in Japan just after a quick message from our sponsor. When you're passionate about transit like me, which if you're watching this channel, you probably are, you probably love the convenience and flexibility riding transit gives us. Whether that means being able to catch a frequent bus, passing right outside your front door, or sitting down in a comfy train and getting some work done along the way. But more often than not, you might find yourself commuting from point A to B and getting a little bit bored. The perils of underground transit without cell reception, or just waiting for a train with not much in terms of entertainment. Fret not, this is where today's sponsor Rocketman comes in. The Rocketman team is always dreaming up new and inventive ways to make traveling on transit more exciting, and now they found a solution for transit doldrums in the form of cold, hard cash back. Introducing Rocketman Rewards, the casual way to earn money while taking transit by answering real-time polls with thrilling questions like whether pineapple truly belongs on pizza, it doesn't, or if dogs make better pets than cats. Think of it as an anonymous way to speak your mind while earning money in the process. Check out Rocketman using the link in the description below and start earning cash back on your commute. This Japanese approach to building and upgrading transit infrastructure is something I've highlighted before. The Haneda monorail went from an express air rail link to something like a metro system to a hybrid of the two. And I think this is because in Japan, there's a really good understanding of the types of transit that work best for different types of people and different types of places. 
as well as the trade-offs you have with different styles of operation and different modes of transportation. Thus, in Japan, it seems to be seen as pretty normal that transit systems will evolve and change over time to continually adapt to the best form of transit for a given route. As it turns out then, many systems in Japan that started as interurbans with traditional looking trams transitioned into something that looks like a hybrid of a metro and a regional rail system. And this long-term transformation opens the door for similar transformations in other places around the world. Now, some of the best examples of these transitions exist in the private railways around Tokyo, which I covered in my Tokyo's Urban Railways Explainer video. Many of these private railways started their operations as an interurban type service. Odakyu, for example, I really like. They've gone from an interurban style system to a high performance regional scale railway that directly integrates into the Chiyoda line of the Tokyo Metro, which in a somewhat circular way kind of means that it's come back to the interurban model of operating straight into a city via local infrastructure. At this point though, parts of Odaku's network, like a major elevated quad track corridor through the dense parts of the megacity, don't really look like a traditional interurban. At the same time though, some of the other traditional elements of interurban style operation have been maintained, like various service levels, rapids, expresses, locals, and the like, as well as the integration of real estate into the railway business, which was a big thing in North America, as people pointed out in the comments of previous videos. A lot of tram and interurban lines in North America used to have things like theme parks at the end of them to create demand for use of those transportation services. I think ultimately though, looking at Japanese private private railways is so interesting because it kind of shows us what might have happened in North America in an alternate reality where we didn't just rip our systems out. Now perhaps what's most interesting about this transition is how it wasn't an overnight shift but a really gradual transition. Corridors were improved and widened with more tracks, grade separations were applied in key places, and in places where railways were basically running straight along road corridors, entire grade separated sections, like that quad track elevated corridor I mentioned before, were constructed to provide a metro style level of service, as well as much more capacity, isolation, and safety. And all of this came together with real estate investments to both fund and benefit from that new infrastructure. Trains started as trams and then went to collections of trams and then ended up as modern metro and regional style trains. So much so that as I mentioned before, they can through run right onto the Tokyo metro system. This approach can be taken back to North America, though perhaps in a slightly more planned and organized way. If we choose to envision what a positive transit oriented future and a final state for some of the lines we've already constructed could be looking at how we need to change our infrastructure over time to meet the demands of our changing cities. For example, if I was planning extensions or expansions to the systems in Seattle or Ottawa, I'd really be thinking about things like how I could soften corners and raise platforms in the future to accommodate larger trains. All of that's entirely possible. With high platforms and fully walked through trains, capacity on these lines could probably be increased on the order of 20 to 30%. Not only would this allow you to have more doors and more frequency, but high floor trains also tend to have higher top speeds, which would be incredibly valuable for some of these rail lines, which are quite long. Cities like Dallas and Denver, on the other hand, need only look within their regions to see other rail lines that are probably better matched to the type of operation that these cities are going for than their existing light rail networks. For example, in Dallas, there's the Silver Line and Texrail, which use European style regional trains, Statler Flirts, which are just lovely. Ottawa also actually uses them. On the other hand, Denver uses high floor North American style electric multiple unit trains, but again, with much more comfortable seating than you typically see in light rail trains. Uh, taking the benefits of these regional rail networks and implementing them on what are relatively infrequent and yet long distance light rail networks would bring a ton of benefits like faster trip times and just more comfortable trips. Not to mention that not having to serve so many different types of rolling stock would bring a lot of economies of scale and other financial benefits. Essentially, these systems are both divided into two distinct networks, even though they're generally providing the same type of service in either case. Now, Los Angeles might be an entirely different story because it is growing massively and because it's already a gigantic urban area. And so it really needs to focus on long-term capacity for its various light rail corridors, which it's built a ton of in recent years and only plans to build more of. In that case, transitioning to a lower intensity but higher quality regional rail service might not be the best approach. And LA already has high platforms, which would be appropriate for a metro style train. 
I've always found it a little ironic because LA's light rail lines are not designed for really high capacities. And yet if they were successful, they would need massive capacity because LA is a big urban area. So in LA, I might literally suggest an approach similar to Tokyo. Entire corridors, which are priorities for faster speeds and higher capacity could be identified. The tightest corners could be removed. Platforms could be extended wherever possible at least. Grade separations could be added and passing tracks and even express tracks could be added to help make those long distance journeys a lot faster. This would allow for a transition to more spacious and high capacity metro trains for local trips and more comfortable and faster express trains for longer distance ones. And such a transition wouldn't be nearly as difficult as it seems because a lot of LA's light rail network is already in dedicated rail corridors for much of its length. Of course, transitioning to higher levels of service is a variable thing, and that should be the case in North America too. Uh, in Japan, lower demand routes stayed more like traditional interurban slash tram lines, whereas the high capacity routes are where you saw the major investment to put giant rail corridors in, speed tracks up, and add capacity. In the same way, it probably makes a lot more sense to turn something like the E in Los Angeles, or perhaps the Crenshaw line, into something more metro-like compared to, say, the Orange Line busway. Now, I hope you can see that, like a lot of the problems we face for transit in North America and around the world, the solutions have long existed in Japan. We just need to start planning and thinking about the future. Thanks for watching.